Welcome to This Enterprising Life, a Star Trek podcast from the Radio Meanwhile Network. My name is Steve Rudd. I'm Nick Gunning, and this week we're leaving a galaxy far, far away to boldly go where no one has gone before. Today, in honor of Star Trek Day, we are discussing the film Star Trek V, The Final Frontier, with special guest Amanda Smith from the David A. Howe Public Library. Welcome, Amanda. Hi, guys. Good to be here. (laughs) (laughs) See, this time, rather than talking about a Star Wars book that we all accidentally (laughs) don't like, we're watching Star Trek V, The Final Frontier, which is always a good time in my mind. Uh, You know, I forgot that that's what we did the last time we were with Amanda, yeah. or at least yeah. I was with Amanda. So yeah. I- I'm, I'm glad we decided to do something just so much better. I want to hear everybody's experiences with this movie when they first saw it and all that, but let me give you some facts about it first. Here we go. <laughs> this movie was directed by William Shatner. Uh, William Shatner and Leonard Nimoy, somewhere along the way, decided to just negotiate all things together. So whatever Nimoy got, Shatner got, and vice versa. So when Nimoy was locked in to direct Star Trek 3, The Search for Spock, it automatically triggered a clause in Shatner's that he could request to direct a movie as well. And here we have Star Trek 5, directed by William Shatner. Hmm. It was written by David Logre. David Logre, do you think, Steve? I don't know. Maybe he could be an Ewok. Uh, It's a story by David Logre, Harv Bennett, and William Shatner. The score is by Jerry Goldsmith. And I mean, I love all the Star Trek music, but this score is pretty good. It's a banger. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We're going to talk about that later. Okay. All right. I just really appreciate how everybody kind of has their own theme. There's like the Cybok theme. There's like the Mm -hmm. mystical. There's like this part's a mystery. This part's funny. And it all kind of has almost like a silent film score in that way where it's sort of like, here's the emotion. You know what I mean? So I love it. Yeah, you can this... hear the story through it really Absolutely. well. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's a good way to put it. I have had this CD like forever because it's just so good. So I've listened to this score a million times. Uh, it was released in theaters on June 9th, 1989. So here we are celebrating its 35th anniversary. Hard to believe. Wow. Yeah. 35th. Let's That's go. That's right. It was released on VHS, Laserdisc, and Glorious Betamax on December 21st, 1989, <laughs> with a DVD following in 1999, and then eventually a Blu-ray in 2009. No 4K yet, and there has been talk of... I mean, it was, Shatner's been on record saying he would love to do like a director's cut and actually do the special mm. effects that they never got to do originally, which... I honestly don't miss him. I'm getting ahead of myself, but I don't feel like, oh, I wish this was more special yeah. effects heavy. Yeah. I think the simplicity works. But anyway, it was novelized by J.M. Dillard. And also there was a comic book adaptation, which I have here. I got in a quarter bin. Uh, it's lots of fun. And let's see. There's a special book called Captain's Log, which is like William Shatner's daughter, who plays a yeoman in this movie, wrote this book kind of with William Shatner, sort of interviewing him about the process. And that's a really interesting read. So if you guys oh. like this movie and have never heard like some of the behind the scenes kind of stuff, it was it's a good read. And you kind of get a sense of what Shatner wanted to do and what he was restricted on doing and, and why the movie generally is viewed as one of the lesser Star Treks. Uh, yeah. I think the book kind of tells that pretty well oh interesting yeah we have our whole main cast returning and then the newbies for this time we have lawrence luck and bill as cybok and there's kind of a famous thing with this casting where for a long time they were making a run at sean connery to play cybok and it just i don't know they kept going back and forth and ultimately it didn't pan out which is something that shatner kind of pokes fun at in the series invasion iowa where they try to get you know, they pretend like Sean Connery's going to be in it. <laughs> That's such a good theory. <laughs> it's super fun. Uh, you, I watched that with you, I think, in the cabin. I know. It's great. Yeah. Oh, it's great. I love it. I'd watch it right now. And the mythical planet that they're trying to find Jacare. is called Shakari, yeah. which is kind of a, a little Sean in-joke. Sean Connery. To, Sean Connery. To Sean Connery. Nice. Yes. I was watching it this time, and I never really thought about that before. And as I watched it, I was trying to picture Sean Connery playing Cybok. 
And I don't, I mean, Lawrence oh, Luckenbill, is kind, he's kind of an unknown, really. I mean, he's done yeah. other television and film work. He's married to Lucy Arnaz, so his mother-in-law was Lucille Ball, you know. But I feel like he brings something to it that I just don't know that Sean Connery, I don't think that would have been right. What do you guys think? I would have struggled in trying to equate Sean Connery with the character. And I think it's because I already have different movies that I've seen Sean Connery in. So because he was more well-known to me, it would have been harder for me to not just see him as, oh, it's Sean Connery on screen. Cool. Yeah. So I think it worked. And I think it worked well with Luck and Bill. Is that his last name? Yeah. Yeah, I think it worked really well with him doing the character as opposed to someone who was a bit more known. Yeah, he was great. He, He definitely, for me, was the strongest character in the entire movie. I'll get to why, too. It's kind of shocking that, I mean, you don't really get, Cybok is referenced in Star Trek Strange New Worlds, but, uh, and there's some comics and things that do more with Cybok, but this is really like his only thing where you see this character, and it really feels like a fleshed out character in a way that you'd think he has all this history and he really doesn't. And yeah, it doesn't, yeah. I I actually come at it like when I watched the movie of wondering what, like wanting a bit more backstory, like mm-hmm. of definitely how he shifted from his Vulcan upbringing to just embracing emotion and completely going out on his own and being banished essentially, yeah, yeah. because of his his attempt to just start an uprising. Yeah, one thing that I think stands up so well about him too is that like it's a hard sell. And this is something Discovery never quite sold. Being like, surprise, Spock has a sibling you've never heard of. I mean, that's a that's a hard oh, yeah. buy-in for an audience who at this point has been watching these characters for over 30 years. But I think Luck and Bill manages to play. They do seem like brothers to me. And I think mm-hmm. Luck and Bill finds the right notes of playing like an estranged older brother. Well, that's you know? that's what it is. It's they haven't that, that theme came up, right? Where Cybok is basically assuming he knows Spock. And yeah. when he does his I know your pain, yeah. it fails because he doesn't know Spock. And Spock points it out of, I am different. I'm not yeah. the troubled, wandering, aimless child you left behind. Yeah. And I think that's significant that like he also thinks he's just going to immediately be on his side. Right. And going back to casting, I think so much of that falls on Luck and Bill's shoulders to really be able to sell that. And he, he does. did a great job. He was amazing. Yeah, I can't imagine. When when I saw that, um, I just was like looking up fun fact. When I saw the Sean Connery thing, I was like, no way. <laughs> no way. That would have that would have made that would have sealed the deal for this being the worst Star Trek movie ever. Yeah, but I think I think, I, think I probably would have said the same thing if it was like, yeah, they're going to get Sean Connery to play Indiana Jones' dad. I'd be like, that's so stupid. Don't do that. You know what I mean? Oh. And he does it. That's so I don't, well, what maybe. if Luck and Bill played Indiana Jones' <laughs> dad? So. Right? No, that no, wouldn't work. So. It just wouldn't eh. work. I mean, Sean Connery's a good actor, so maybe he could have come up with it. I don't know, but I, I'm happy with Lawrence Luck and Bill. Yeah. Also, we have George Murdoch as mm. the god entity, and he recurs on Next Generation as Admiral J.P. Hansen, which I didn't realize oh. that, but oh. as soon as I read that, I was like, oh, yeah, it is the same guy. So. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Uh, same with Charles Cooper, who plays the Klingon ambassador, Kord. He is also oh, a Next great. Gen as Kempek. Kempek, yeah. Oh, Kempek. I knew I'd seen him somewhere. Yeah, yeah okay. he's still recognizable. <laughs> we have Cynthia Gao as Caitlin Dar, the Romulan ambassador. Not a very Romulan name, Caitlin, but... Nah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we have Bill Quinn as McCoy's father, which I think, again, we're getting ahead of ourselves, but I, I really feel like DeForest Kelly's acting in that scene with his father is so good. And it's just such yeah. a different emotion for McCoy to play. It's a completely different side of McCoy and he brings it. And he tries to hold it back too. Yeah, he you does. see like I, yeah. I, when I saw it the second, I watched it twice. I had to watch it twice, but yeah, he totally, you, you see yeah. him like really trying to fight, letting go of the pain until yeah. you see Cybok doing that thing where he like crosses behind him and yeah. he's like, dang, like what right. are you going to do? Yeah. Is that, are you sure? Almost yeah. like Jedi mind tricking. <laughs> yeah, like really just driving mm-hmm. it into him till he finally cracks and he starts freaking out. Right. Yeah. Very good. That what a intense scene. No music. No sound. Nothing. Yeah. It's, just, it's oh really my simple. Gosh, 
it's so really uncomfortable. Simple. I know. Uh, so anyway, Bill Quinn is the actor who plays the senior McCoy. This is his final film role, and his career dates back oh, wow. to 1923 with the film wow. No Mother to Guide Her. And he acted pretty consistently right up until this, and, and here we have his final role. Our featured cast member today is David Warner, who plays St. John Talbot, or St. John Talbot, as he says. <laughs> He's the Federation representative in the world yeah. of galactic peace. And he is back in Star Trek VI as a different character, Chancellor Gorkhan. Yep. He also notably okay. plays Gul Madred in Star Trek The Next Generation. There are four lights. No way, oh. that's him? Yes. No. Oh, wow. Well. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Right. yes, he's the Cardassian, yeah. No way. Huh. What a great, uh, what a great yeah. episode. Three very different Star Trek roles for yeah. uh, David Warner. Uh, he also plays a very memorable character in uh, Ninja Turtles 2, Secret of the Ooze. He's the professor. Go, professor, Ninja, yep. go, Ninja, go. Uh, and in the Star Wars world, which is where Steve and I usually live, he voiced Grand General Brashen in the video game Star Wars Fleet Commander. No way. Amanda, have you played that one? I haven't played that one. Oh, I thought I thought for sure you were going to be like, of course, General Brashen. Oh, right. I mean, you I would think him. so, but I, I, I actually do. Huh. I did think. <laughs> Okay, before we get into this movie, I'm curious to know the earliest you remember watching it and if your opinions of it have changed at all over the years. So, Steve, hit me. When did you watch this movie first? Uh, I don't know exactly when, but it was probably early 90s. Okay. So when this would have been out on VHS, my family was very into Star Trek. Oh, yeah. And so whenever this hit, you know, the shelves at Blockbuster, we were there. Okay. So I do remember seeing it when I was fairly young and just being like, I really don't know what's going on. This yeah. is the one that confused okay. me the most. I yeah. remember. Fair. <laughs> I just remember just being like, I, I don't, I don't get any of this. I, I'm sure, yeah. you know, this is weird. Um, so yeah, like I was, I was young, uh, probably early nineties, probably like 93, 94, you know, okay. soon after it came right. on VHS. What about you, Amanda? So I was a bit later in the game when I saw it, it was probably, Oh, I don't know. Late nineties, I mm. would say, maybe early two thousands. My my grandma had like the box set of VHSs yeah. for oh, yeah. the, the collection. Oh, it was great. And like of course they culminate together to show the Enterprise yep. on all of them together. Which I still cool. have that box and, set. I still have that box set. Oh nice. No way. That's awesome. And it's still at my grandma's house. Anyway. Oh, um, up. So I was probably like a tweenish age in watching it the first time through. And I haven't I haven't watched it in years. So coming back and watching it again, it was just like the full load of nostalgia. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I forgot how much I love these movies. Yeah. So yeah. it was a great it was a great thing to revisit and just like reminisce about spending time at my grandma's house watching Star Trek and things like that. And yeah, it was great. I remember the first Trek that I saw in theaters and see if we've talked about this a little bit, but was, was Star Trek Generations. I remember going yep. to that with my Me grandma. Too, 95. I remember yeah. waiting in line at the Cineplex Odeon. <laughs> so oh, nice. Star Trek Generations is what kind of like kicked it off for me. Like I remember reading the junior novelization of that and kind of going backwards and wanting to watch more of like the Kirk movies and stuff. So, but I was probably, you know, more like high school. So yeah, I'm probably with you, Amanda, late nineties watching it. And I remember, you know, we used to, in college, Steve and I would watch these, I don't know, we'd get like a bunch of friends together and, and watch through the whole row of movies you know over the course of, of a couple of weeks or something i feel like we did oh, that nice. a, cu a couple of times i think a during couple college. of times, a couple yeah. of times. <laughs> and i remember Put thinking yeah i remember thinking like oh star trek 5 is is kind of the dumb one but i like it anyway but watching it now i'm just like i love this movie i don't know i don't think it's dumb i've never really bought into the odd ones are bad because I think three is so cool. I know uh, you love three, and that is literally the worst one for me. I do. It's so funny. I, like. It's all. I mean, the relationships. I think the relationships, like not having yeah. Spock, having Kirk have to like navigate without Spock, and three, I think, is really just brings out something in the character. I like the stuff with David and Savick. But anyway, watching it again, I feel like the humor really lands, and the stuff that people oh, tend yeah. to yeah. poke fun at the most, like the camping scenes and stuff. I don't know. It's so I, iconic, that scene. I think that it's those so characters so have earned it, you know? We're 30 yeah. plus years into this world, into these three being this, like, icon. And I think, like, I am ready to sit down and watch them just be friends. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I think that's yeah. really unique, and I like it a lot. So, 
I don't know. Well, it brings out their friendship in a different dynamic because they're yeah. not like working together. And, you know, yeah. it shows in, in Kirk being like, Spock, call me Jim. Yeah. You know, we're yeah. off duty. Call me yep. Jim. Yep. And Bones being like, come to the, come camping. It'll be great. You will have a nice getaway. Yeah. I'm going to have a nervous breakdown. They actually <laughs> made that marshmallow dispenser. Like that was one of the tie-ins to this. Oh, you for you real? could get a Star Trek marshmallow dispenser yes that's cool the the movie like initially like the opening weekend was really good and then after that it kind of went down it you know it didn't it didn't have the same response that star Rewatch. trek 4 has you yeah. know it, it it like word of mouth i think was negative and stuff but i really feel like when you look at the movies the original six when you look at the movies it's like they all are kind of doing a different thing and this right. is like you're looking at like over the course of the original series or even later Star Trek, it's like you kind of get that off kilter odd episode that really resonates. And I feel like that's what this movie is, you know, in a good way. The way that Shatner directs it, he wants it to be very much like the motion picture. Mm. It, it has that like wonder and discovery. And the music is this synthy. I mean, it's the same composer. He got the yeah. same composer to, to, to do this because he wanted it to be the same. But he also wanted cuteness and the the wit that is Star Trek Four, yeah. Right, and so it it's almost like the movie doesn't know what it wants to be because it's trying to be as much as it possibly can. And I mm. felt like what does this movie dirty is the lack of special effects. If you notice, there's like very few ship scenes, yeah, and they're mm -hmm. not the best. However, this movie did seem like it was a love letter to shuttlecrafts. Did you notice that? That there's mm. like a <laughs> lot of shuttlecraft. That's, That's true. true. That you know? is true. And I hadn't so thought about that. Yeah. I, I wonder why I, I had to sit there and wonder like, why is there so much shuttlecraft? And if you notice, Everything is shot very stylistically when they're in a shuttlecraft. Mm -hmm. And if you if you notice when they land on Shakari, they're all kind of standing there looking yeah. out. And they're in that kind of like row with their heads, yep. like a yep. perfect shot. And then they walk out and then they turn and it's the same row, just the other direction. Yeah. And I'm like, man, this is just all when you beam somebody down, it's shotless. You just yeah. it's an open shot. But then when they're in the shuttlecraft, you're forced to use your film artois and like set up the shot perfectly and you know the things like that like the turbo lift they come in and if the camera doesn't pan to the front of them it's they're just we're just looking at their backs and it's almost kind of like all right well i guess we're in here with them right it gives it gives <laughs> you that feel that you're like in the movie with them you're in the shuttlecraft with them and i just thought that that like there's so many aspects of the movie that are good and there's so many aspects of the movie that's just so bad that like when I saw rewatching it again, I was just like, you know, I kind of know this movie isn't as good as the rest, but I still appreciate it because this movie really set the tone for Star Trek six mm. and, and, and mm. it set the musical tone for the, the Picard movies after that. Mm -hmm. Um, I can get into that later. I'd like to bring up the music later, but, uh, but yeah, okay. like I, 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 it's almost like I'm accepting the fact that I know it's not as good, but it's not, I don't think it's as, it, I don't think it's not as good for the same reasons that I didn't think it was good when I was a kid. I, I see. Just kind of, I, I kind of thought it was just dumb, but now it's just like, look for all its faults. I, I'm trying to, I'm, do, I am being biased and I'm trying to find the good and see how the, the good aspects actually do influence further movies. Okay. I don't think I can go with you on it not being as good. I think it, I think it's goals are different, but I feel maybe I have, think I have a rosier opinion of this than well, you. It's more I, character based. I feel like it, sure. it goes for different things and it hits those notes pretty well. But let's get into it. But before we do, hit me with a, an uber detailed or at least a, a DVD esque synopsis of this movie so people know what we're talking about. All right. The synopsis. All right. The uber detailed plot or the. the <laughs> somewhat uber detailed plot yeah. of star trek five the final frontier the greatest enterprise of all is adventure mm. when a renegade vulcan captures the federation klingon and romulan ambassadors on nimbus 3 the so-called planet of galactic peace it can only mean one thing the vacation is over Captain James C. Kirk and the crew of the Starship Enterprise A are pressed back into service to come to the rescue.
But when the Vulcan has a prior association with Spock, it allows him to seize control of the Enterprise and put it on course for the center of the galaxy where he and his followers believe they find the place from which creation sprung. Okay. One thing that stood out to me watching it this time around, like in, in a way, like this quest for God is a pretty big thing to mm-hmm. tackle. And I know right. that we, we go to, you know, we go to Paradise City, we go to this, the planet of galactic peace, we go to Shakari. So, you know, yeah. we are changing it. But I feel like at its core, this is kind of a bottle episode. You know, this kind of feels to me like you have, we have our main characters in a room and they're just like, I don't know, riffing off each other. And like, it's, it's kind of like a puzzle that they're solving together. But in a way, despite the grand themes, the scope is very small because I think it's all about like their individual journeys. So uh, I guess like with that in mind, Amanda, how do you feel? Like, how does this movie hit you? Like coming off of something like Star Trek four or just approaching this movie cold? Like what's, what's your initial take on it? What do you, what do you think? So like as a kid, I can resonate with what Steve was saying of it, just feeling a little disjointed and Mm. struggling a bit to kind of follow it somewhat. But, like, as an adult watching it again after so many years of having not seen the original series, um, I I appreciated it better, and I felt like the different themes that they were trying to tackle were, they are big themes, like, as you were talking about, mm-hmm. but I think they were able to kind of explore it in such a way that it was if not fully achieved in its manageability, still achievable, so I I kind of appreciate that they touched on like minor themes, but also fixated on that more major theme to follow it through. Yeah. It again, it's still not like my favorite book out of the listing, <laughs> but I think I appreciated it better than I did particularly as like a tween teen. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I, I do feel like I my that's that's one way in which mine has changed a little bit that I, I I think I just look for different things of it. And there are parts that I just love and I kind of wait for those. And one of my favorite yeah. things about Star Trek always is Kirk, Spock, McCoy. And I feel yeah. like oh, yes. maybe more than any other movie, you get that here because in four, oh, gosh, yes. in four, you know, Kirk and Spock are kind of on their own thing. And McCoy is like on a side quest, you know, and in three. You don't. You don't have Spock at all. In six, right. it's it's McCoy and Kirk. Yeah, six. It's McCoy right? and Kirk. Yeah, yes. and you know, two. Y- you do. Ca- you do kind of get a little bit more of that. One Spock is off on its own thing, and McCoy comes in later. So I feel like, movie wise, this is the best representation of the Kirk Spock McCoy dynamic, and I love mm, having that. That's a good point. I didn't even think of that. It's sort of. I almost feel like, uh, in a hierarchical fashion, Spock and bones are are sort of like Mm siblings-esque and bones is always heckling spock yes in some capacity just to try and get a rise out of him and kirk is almost like either the oldest brother or the father of the group and just kind of being like i need to keep these two in line (laughs) so that particularly bones doesn't go off the rails and trying to get get some kind of dig into spock yeah i've always loved about these particularly the movies the, the way that they don't try to deny the fact that these are like old men. These are like old right, people. Yeah, they're really old, yeah. You know, and like that comes into play a lot in, in, in Wrath of Khan, you know, where Kirk is, I think he's turning 40, where he's just like feeling that. And here, you know, it's like McCoy's like, I don't have a heart attack if you want me to climb this kind of thing. Oh, I yeah. Do it. I'm yeah. an old man. You know, so I Maybe really, I'll meet you at the top. I really like that we're not trying to hide the fact that these characters have aged 30 years, you know, like these are, yeah. these are not, you know, not that McCoy was ever young, but like, these are not the young characters that they were. And there's no attempt to like, you get to age with them. You get to go along this journey and they're not trying to play the same Kirk that he was in season two. Right. You know what I mean? Like we're not doing that. Yeah. Right. It's, and it's nice that they build it in because it adds more, um solidity to the characters as opposed to yeah. just being like well this is kind of a cheap fake of yeah. what i'm getting here yeah. yeah i do feel that age hits a little harder in this one though like the, yeah. from between four and five you see it i mean I th- you especially see it in like scotty you know yeah. like all of a sudden just very mm-hmm. you know all of a sudden he's just completely different different shape yeah and mccoy just looks very very old and it's almost like i feel like like 
all the actors kind of look better in Star Trek four and six, but this yeah. one kind of like, Hey, you want to make a movie? All right. You know, like let's do it next month. And they didn't have time to like be physically fit. You know, I think their age in Star Trek five feels a little bit like when you've had a bad haircut and it hasn't had time to grow out yet, you know, like they're <laughs> yeah, younger like... <laughs> in four and in six, they're decidedly older, but it's almost like they've gotten over that hump and now they're just like true. elder they're statesmen. You know? Yeah. 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 So I thought that the supporting cast gets a lot of fun things to do here. Like they get a lot of fun things. I've honestly never minded the little hints of romance with Uhura and Scotty. I mean, I know that's yeah, kind of silly, yeah. but it's also fun. I mean, these are people who work together all the time, so like, why not? I had forgotten that that was there, actually, and so I when it was there, I was yeah. like, oh, wow, okay, yeah. I so forgot. did the filmmakers of Star Trek VI because it's never addressed <laughs> again. <laughs> oh, that's I, true! I don't understand making the Enterprise that because that's another thing. Okay, that's another thing. We lose the Enterprise in Star Trek Three. There's no Enterprise in Star Trek Four, and we're introduced to the Enterprise A in this movie. So it's yep. been a long time since we've had the Enterprise as like a base, right. which is which is kind of cool. I don't understand the idea of making the Enterprise A bad and falling apart. I think that's a real misstep. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I struggled with that because it's like. Th that was kind of done in, um, like I said, this is like almost a remake of the motion picture. That was the same thing in the motion picture, right? Hey, we got a mission. Well, crap, we're not really all ready yet. We're not yeah. even fully crewed. McCoy comes in, you know, kind of halfway yeah. through. Type I deal. was drafted. Yeah, and it's just, and <laughs> I, it, the, the, the problems almost seem... The problems were different. This one was like, you know, the doors didn't quite close all the way. Yeah. The transporter wasn't working. Oh, right? yeah. The captain's log, you know, I brought that up. The captain's yeah. log's broken. It's like, it's not even yeah. attached to the ship. Stop. Like, it's yeah. too much. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that that was strange, especially when, um, when we're kind of introduced to uh, the Enterprise A inside of the space station. Uh, I think we pan over the Excelsior. Do we not? I think yeah. you're right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's like, Surely the Excelsior could have handled this. Right. <laughs> like, That's a you good know, point. Like, and well, it, but they, no, no, no. They acknowledge that. They acknowledge that. They they're do like, acknowledge it. Uhura's but, like, we're in no shape. And they're like, yeah, really but no other you got the experience. That's what they're saying. They're saying it's the experienced crew. So That's at problem. least they acknowledge Our it. It's got a problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They did. They yeah, it has it. to be you because you're yeah. the only one that could handle a sensitive situation like this. But I mean, surely. Yeah, I guess. I guess no. <laughs> I guess there's nobody else available and ready and willing in yeah. Starfleet to handle a situation like that. Which do you is think sad. it's a reflection in some way on like the age component we were talking about, of where it seems like yeah. you know things are breaking down, but maybe it's more of a oh, yeah. just because things are falling apart, it could still it can still, it can still get the job done in some yeah. way. It just you have to that's, modify it. That's a good point. That's a good like point. they're old and broken down, and they're yeah. and they're. They are kind of realizing their mortality a little bit, yeah. right? With They're the whole... aging, at least. Yeah, I think that's a great ex thing to bring up, Amanda. That like it, it, the ship is kind of the representation of them, a little bit broken yeah. down, still able to make the journey, still does it. It's got a you know packs a punch when it needs to, takes the hits, and they get home. Yeah, you know, in the end, yeah. I think that's yeah. that's that's that's, uh, that's very insightful. I, I think that Cybok as our, I mean, it's like he's a villain for the first half and then he's not really a villain anymore because they're all like, yeah, let's see what's, let's see what's out there, you know? Right, right. I feel like he's an antagonist more than a villain. Yes. He's really just, yeah. Like he's not a true villain because the, the moment somebody gets hurt, right? When Kirk gets shot back by God. He's like, whoa, this is not what, you know, yeah, yeah. you know, this is not what we were talking about, you, you know, and so it, it's, and that's why I think they should have kind of spelled out Cybok's intentions earlier on, because there's a very specific scene when Kirk fights Cybok in the uh, shuttle bay. Love all that. Love that oh, whole what a great, <laughs> great scene. Yeah, yeah. You can see the wires and everything. <laughs> yeah. Where, where Cybok goes, you know, I'm right. Yeah, and I was like, it, "We're not given the purpose of Cybok's plan until they're in the room with the the ship wheel, and he's like, we 'We're gonna go find God uh, because I heard a a call to him or something like that, right? A vision. He said he's received a vision, and so it's just like, man, we're like, we're like fifty minutes into this movie, and he finally, <laughs> says, 
plan is, I see why they do that because there's kind of like a whole mystery of who he is and what the heck is going on. But after I watched it a second time, I was like, man, it really would have been nice to have something like that at the beginning and then reveal a little bit more of the story of his purpose later on, rather than for 50 minutes being like, what is Cybok doing? And, <laughs> and so it's, he's using an ends justify the means. Exactly. That that's exactly it. The ends are justifying the means, but we don't know what the, we don't even know what the, <laughs> we don't know what the ends are, you know, until the very end. And it's just like, Oh well, yeah. Okay. And that's, that, you know? that's kind of the exact opposite of what you see from Khan because, you True, don't really yeah. get. I feel like, you know, I mean you have you have Cruz in, in Star Trek three, but I don't really feel like in the movies you get a strong villain like Khan. And it's kinda not until you have Cybok where you have another character who sort of feels like a co lead. You know what I mean? Cybok yeah, feels he does feel like a co lead. You know, yeah. So yeah. I don't whereas with Khan, it's like you know right away. In the very first scene with Chekhov, he's like, Kirk marooned me on this planet, my wife died. My family died, and now I'm going after Kirk because I hate his guts. Like, boom, you get that right away. Right. As soon as you see Khan, yeah. you know. And in this, Very classic you villain. don't, you don't. But I also don't really miss it. Like, kind of like the opposite of what you're feeling, Steve. I don't really feel like I miss it. And when he says that thing to Spock about, you know I'm right, I feel like that's more, that's more to inform the relationship between Cybok and Spock than it is to, like, get the audience on any one side. I, I think it it's pulling the mystery out. They all want the same thing. Yeah. You realize they all want the same thing. When, when they go into the, um, into the uh, Great Barrier, you know, Kirk looks down at the boldly go where no man has gone before, right? So They're ultimately all explorers. They're all so explorers. Like, it yeah, all just aligns. One is like, well, I just want to do it this way. And Kirk, Spock, and McCoy are kind of the, you know we've been ingrained to do it this way because we believe it's the right way. And so they're both, they're all explorers. So, I mean, that kind of makes sense. And I guess mm -hmm. that does kind of pull it back a little bit, but I still just feel like, I don't know, maybe his kid, I, you know, I, I wonder what it would like, would have been like if they did tell us that up, we wouldn't, maybe you wouldn't care as much if they didn't have that mystery held on to for so long would we have a plagueous moment if they had done that and just been uh, like well yes. the whole story is exposed yeah. now, you know. yes that's true yeah that's true, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay well, yeah, yeah. i also feel like you have to be really careful about introducing the idea that you know this guy's searching for god in space like mm. there's no way that's like true. it's almost like you have to be you have to be invested in what's going on and in the dynamics before they can drop something like that without an audience just clicking away and being like, this is insane. I can't, yeah. I can't follow this. And I feel like that's kind of why Cybox work because it's like all about charisma. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. like you, you yeah. do kind of like, he is an, he is a compelling actor to watch and that what makes Cybox. Yeah. Like you want to know what's going on. I don't know. Amanda, how do you feel about all this? What do you think about Cybok? What do you think about the uh, holding off on the reveal uh, until so late in the movie? I sort of feel like the long wait almost makes the audience become more like explorers because they have mm. to kind of parse out as much as they can, like what's going on with the story and who is this character yeah. Cybok and what, like what, what are his motives? Are they good motives? Are his means justifiable, etc. And then so you get to that kind of point of being on the edge of the Great Barrier and, you know, Kirk and the rest of his crew, well, those who are not like brainwashed, twisted by Cybok, you know, yeah. they, they kind of make this big shift and they're like, yeah, you know what, we'll go and explore as opposed to being like, they do. total yeah, uprising, we're going to take really? back our ship. And so I, I remember finding that a bit jarring, part of me thinking, wait, but... You have this guy and these other people who are taking over your ship, and now you're just going to go along with them. If it, but yeah. as I thought about they it, I was like, oh, it's because it's, they're explorers at heart. And yeah, while they don't yeah. agree, they're kind of on that journey with him in that moment, at least. So while yeah. there is part of me now that... Here. <laughs> right, now that we're here, we might as well complete it, even though we're kind of yeah. being held at gunpoint S. I think that kind of goes back to what I was saying about it feeling like a bottle episode because you never mm -hmm. feel like Starfleet plays a role or like the yeah, hundreds no, of people true. on the Enterprise plays a role. It's really just like 
Kirk, Spock, McCoy, Cybok, and and that's it. But right, anyway, so John Locke and Jalad of yeah, uh, the Star true. Trek movies. For an audience sake, it kind of works well. But I also there is a part of me that wonders too how much of that slow reveal was because that's how stories were told at the time, as opposed mm. to nowadays where it's very much more, well, not always, but sometimes a bit more cut and dry. This is what's happening. This is the action element. This is where we're going. And so the pacing feels different and things like that. So I think it works really well. Uh, I'm inclined to agree with you, Nick, that if they had just full front uh, showcase, this is exactly what's happening. People might've very quickly been like, eh, but because it has that slow reveal and it pulls the audience in and makes them ask questions and become kind of interested, I think it works really well. Mm. Yeah, that that's a good point. And I think, too, it's like by the time everybody's on board and you know what the plot is, for me, that's a little bit where the movie loses momentum because mm. we have this whole thing build up. It's like the center of the universe. It's completely impenetrable, but except it's not because they just like drive right through it like, <laughs> right. like it's nothing. You, th- you didn't think they would have done that before? <laughs> well, and the Klingon ship follows them through. It's like, oh, well, fine. Right. I mean, sure, maybe There's they really kind of pinged off, but. Yeah. It's, oh, yeah, yeah the really Klingon ship good. totally follows them, too. Yeah. It's like, I, was, uh, I was watching this with my wife, and uh, she was like, oh, wow, this is, this is Eden. This is heaven. Like, it's just like sparse rocks. And I, yeah. <laughs> I never thought of that before, but she said that. And I was like, yeah, why didn't we go for some, like, lush like tropical paradise kind of thing why is it a completely barren rock like that that is an odd well because it's truly do. a plant it's it's a prison yes yeah that's I guess. why that's i mean true. right so we're meant to believe and i think that's clever in the story that we're mm-hmm. meant to believe that it is like cybok was 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 tricked into thinking that it was an eden yeah and that there was a god there when it wasn't Right, and that's right. The kind of the whole point, right? That's true. I just, I guess, I would have appreciated some dialogue where they were like, "Well, this sucks." Like, right. why, you know what I mean? Like, what? Like, right. remember, but they don't like, really they get off the shuttle and onto the planet. I'm like, ugh, no, thanks. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. don't know. That would not be my guess. We'll walk. Yeah. I, I guess we'll walk. Something that has bugged me every time I watch this movie is that Cybok suddenly has a completely different haircut on Shakari. Does anybody notice this? Oh, I did not. Actually, no, you're right. It does kind of look like his <laughs> he has like a extension or like a um fuller hair. And then when they're on Shakari, his hair is very much like wispy. I wonder yeah. if it's because there's so much wind oh, maybe. that uh, he had a hair piece that came out. That is a good point. But I, I thought his hair was long. And all of a sudden on Shakari, I was like, oh, oh, he's got short hair. When he's on the, the planet of galactic peace or whatever, he has like a, basically a mullet. Like he's got hair draping okay. over his shoulders. Does he? Okay. Yeah. I did not remember yeah. this detail. Oh, man, he does oh, yeah. have a tail, a ponytail. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, and it just doesn't have it at all. So it's like they forgot the extensions that day. I don't really know. Oh, funny. I don't know what's really going on. But oh, anyway, man. let's talk. Let's talk about the Planet of Galactic Peace for a minute because, in some ways, I'm like that's stupid, but it also really feels like kind of smart writing because it's such a like bureaucrat kind of thing that's like oh yeah let's you know let's this is a peaceful planet and we're gonna send ambassadors and the fact that then it just kind of fails and everybody forgets about it that feels like such a political stunt to me so i totally yeah. buy it but it, the fact that it gives cybok easy access to high-ranking mm-hmm. ambassadors from klingon romulan and federation space yeah. i think is also a pretty cool like it's a clever way to get him these high profile hostages which i have to True. sort of appreciate so yeah one of the things that i i read about the production of this was this was also the first star trek that had to compete with other star trek because oh. by this point next gen was in season two so oh, like in between yeah. Star Trek four and Star Trek five, you had next gen season one. And so you're sort of filming uh, next gen season two and Star Trek five at the same time. So now it's like, you've got the Picard era and the Kirk era going together for the first time. And mm. I wonder if that threw people at all, as far as response and stuff, it's like, Oh, yeah. maybe. Yeah. I hadn't thought about There's that. this new thing going on. And here are these like, old, not that I think Patrick Stewart was hip, but like there's a new Star Trek and this is kind of old Star Trek. I don't know. But I do know that definitely when they're running through the halls on the Enterprise, it's 100% the, the uh, next-gen sets. Yeah. Oh, it's like yeah. The, the turbo lips open. It's like the carpet and the beige. And I'm like, all Everything right. Everything is, yeah. All right. It just kind of 
jazzed it up a little bit to make it look yes. like it's the Enterprise A. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So. So I, I wanted to talk a little bit about, I was talking about this with Amanda before uh, we started recording, but the soundtrack of this. Yes. So if you want to talk about characters, uh, right? Yes. I, I, I love talking about when the, when the soundtrack itself becomes its own character in the movie, yeah. helping to tell the story, almost like a narrator. Yeah. Jerry Goldsmith does a clinic on what, what, what Amanda said about themes. Yep. And everything kind of has a theme. You know, what's, if you were to listen to it, you know, kind of what's going on or who's talking based on it. It's almost like yep. like uh, what um, John Williams does with Star Wars, that mm -hmm. you, you get the feel of what's going on. But I was listening to it. And I mean, this is the soundtrack's a banger. It is. It is. It's, no, it's it, great. It's, it's it, it really ties back to original Star Trek the essence of the original Star Trek motion picture, because Jerry Goldsmith does the original motion picture, yeah, right. And James Horner kind of takes the the, the horn, <laughs> at, horns after that. Um, but uh, literally the horns, literally, literally the horns, too. and and then it goes to Rosenbaum for Voyage Home, which is a very unique soundtrack itself, and then it comes back to Jerry Goldsmith. And I uh, I was noticing um, that there are certain themes in this movie that Jerry Goldsmith uses later on. For first contact, oh. where, where where there's those those scenes where there's like nervousness or anticipation there, that there's like the the um the uh, uh the, the intensity of the scene is building and there's this like bum 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 yeah. bum. So I, I was like, wait mean. a minute, I know yep. that theme, I know that, and I, I was driving, I was driving to work and I put on the first contact theme because I was like, where is it? Where is that theme? And first contact does the da 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 bum 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 bum, and I was like, "There it is!" Jerry Goldsmith brings it back for first contact for those those intense some of those intense scenes, and I just think that like Jerry Goldsmith created that theme and then wanted it to be a part of Star Trek. Right, because because yeah. generations is in between. Uh, Dennis McCarthy does that soundtrack, yeah, and it, it's it, it's again another very different soundtrack. But like, man, I, I just thought the the whole like um, Amanda was talking about the different themes and like he uh, uh, Ger Jerry Goldsmith brings back that synthy spacey theme. It, it just everything fits very very well and. Uh, I just thought this is one of those movies where the soundtrack itself is its own character. It's its own character to appreciate and talk about and really drives the story. I just think, yeah, I, I mean, really what well. a great soundtrack. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. It's really great. To fast forward slightly into like the, the newer movie renditions of Star Trek, I really appreciated mm -hmm. how uh, the composer, Michael Giacchino, he, he like pays homage to the original Star Trek by interweaving mm -hmm. the theme from it into his own like concept of what Star Trek yeah. sounds like. Yeah, he just, does. Like, I know yes. what you mean. Yeah, and I just I was really it was really nice to have that nostalgia kind of nod to what it originally was, but still make it his yep. own and not just be like, uh, oh, it's a total copy. I'm just gonna riff on yep. it. Yeah. So yeah, I appreciate how like there's overlap in various Star Trek <laughs> the Star Trek world in terms of the yeah. the composition of the music. It's great. Yeah. Do you know, uh, while we're talking Jerry Goldsmith for a minute, I love the score for the Supergirl movie. It's not a good movie, but the mm. score is so good. And that's one I've listened to over and over again. I think Goldsmith, he has a lot of scores like that that you can just listen to without context. You know what oh, I mean? Yeah. You can just yeah. sit there and, you know. You so can tell I, what's going on. And I love that about a movie when, like, you can tell what's going on yeah. just by the yeah, soundtrack. The and when you listen, it makes it worth listening, right? You know, like, because then you're, like, imagining the scene in your head as it's going. I just, well, I watched, I just think that... I watched, like, a, a master class that um, Hans Zimmer did, and he was talking oh, about yeah. how he says, you know, the main goal of what we're doing is we're telling a story. Like... You have the visual aspect of what's going on in the story and the auditory aspect of the characters talking, but the music underneath really not only helps to uplift that and support it, but it also tells the story at the same time. Yeah. So 
And I mean, yeah. maybe that's not the same approach that each composer takes, but at the same time, I just, I feel like Jerry Goldsmith did that very much within this movie. Like you were talking about Steve, that there's just yeah. a scene can come on. And even if you're not looking at it, you're like, Oh, it's the Klingons. They're there because yep. their yep. theme is going or some other element. Yeah, that's playing. his theme too. And yeah. Do you know what's interesting though? That like, I feel like this soundtrack itself is is timeless and could not be tied to any one single movie, right? Mm -hmm. You could mm -hmm. you could almost say like, oh man, is this the are these themes that are in Star Trek three? Oh these yeah, themes that are in Star Trek. 3? Where like if you get like the Voyage Home soundtrack is very different. It is only the Voyage Home. It only yeah. would work in that movie. Right. I same think it's true. Of Wrath of Khan is the same too. It's Wrath of so Khan, unique. that's true. It, it, that is a very, I mean, that is a very aggressive soundtrack. It is. And, and it has <laughs> it to really be is. because of the type of movie. And then Search yeah. for Spock, almost James Horner really gets again that like whimsically mystical mm. mystery soundtrack yeah. that goes on. Uh, that That's pretty amazing. But like this. It's nautical. Like, it's also kind of nautical. Like the Wrath of it Khan. Is very, yeah, it is kind you know of. What I mean? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, I just think this is like, this is just it, all these themes that he does is just Star Trek. It's not like yeah. specifically Star Trek four, you know? Um, cause I, I, again, I went back and listened to all the soundtracks and I was like, man, so good. this one is like quintessential Star Trek. And it really does. It's interesting. Like it doesn't do what generations does mm -hmm. where this soundtrack bridges the original movies and the Picard movies after it, because it has themes from both series, um, which I just thought was, was really cool. And this is like all undiscovered country just kind of gets in there. But if, if Star Trek five, uh, if generations were the next movie after Star Trek five, it would be perfectly fit as oh, far yeah. as how the sound go that like, yeah, like uh, Goldsmith kind of leaves that like mystical explorer type soundtrack and theme yeah. and goes into the whole first contact style uh, uh of soundtrack which is much more action-packed and intense but i mean this soundtrack has it all uh, it's it a does. great soundtrack man. you know i i have this i have just the bare bones cd that they put out forever ago but in 2010 la la land records put out a double cd edition that has all of the cues on it oh, and i've cool. always wanted it i've always wanted it because it's like it's so much longer and has tons of it has alternate takes and it also just has music that they didn't you didn't get uh, on the CD. The CD oh, is also okay. not sequenced according to the film, so I don't know if they if oh. it's supposed to be a better listening experience that way. I don't know, but um, it doesn't follow the the film so much anyway. But yes, great music. I really think the humor lands in this. Yes. Um, but let's uh, <laughs> let's move on to some some good and bad discussions. All right. So uh, first, Amanda, I want to know your worst moment. So give me your darn it, Jim moment. <laughs> oh, you know, I okay. think, and it might have been part of the time, but just like when they're on Shockery and they're talking to the entity there, just the special effects that were used. And again, I think it's it's time frame of what they had available. Uh, yeah. Like the constant strobing was a little tough to take. I was like, yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah, because it. Ne you know, I never really feel, I know like Cybok wants it so bad that he's kind of blinded to how obvious it is that this is not what he's looking for. Right. But yeah. I do kind of wish that you had a moment where watching the movie, you kind of thought really they're going to see God. And I don't think anything they do post breaching the barrier gives you that impression at no. all and i yeah. i feel like that's kind of a missed opportunity what about you steve what's your darn gym moment oh geez you know <laughs> basically everything <laughs> now like so, i mean so amanda we talk about or at least i talk about um when i bring things up that are like nitpicky where like oh, i yeah. try to stop him but he just keeps doing it <laughs> well when, when there are things that are like really easy to not mess up but yeah. somehow just gets through like I th when they're going up the decks and it's all of a sudden deck 78 and I'm like, ah, I think the enterprise has like 24 decks or 25 decks. Oh yeah. On deck 78. As and they're like, up, and it's like deck 50, deck 52, deck 68, deck 78, deck 52, deck 68. And it's like, wait a minute. What? <laughs> we just I, went yes. down again. You know? I, yeah. I did <laughs> notice that. I did notice the number went backwards once. I didn't. I, I remember 
thinking that the the Spock and the boots thing is a little bit weird. Oh, okay. And when they're like, when they're like, hey, let's climb up these apparently seventy eight decks. Spock disappears and joins them from below. From and it's above, like, yeah. And I'm like, and, or no, from, from, above, a, from above. From above. Yeah. And I'm down, like, yeah. wait a minute. Shouldn't they just have all gone with Spock? Right. And they could have just been way up there. <laughs> I like, know. That's I know. Me. I was like, nah, nah. Oh, that was really dumb. I, I, yeah. And I thought, I, I thought, I'm going to bring this up. And Nick, I'm not going to let you go with that being nitpicking because that's a, <laughs> no. that's a big, that, that's a big problem. That's like, not a, no, that's, I think that's fair. I thought the same, like, there's no reason for it. That's to your point. Reason. It's like, you might as well all have just gone visually though. It would have been just as like, Oh, there we go again. If he came up, just kind of like whizzed up, up past him. Yeah, like, oh, that's where he is. I mean, he could have even like zipped past them and like kind of came down slowly. Right. You yes. know, but no, it's it's like, well, if you were already there, you were we're trying to get there and you were yeah. just there. <laughs> just, so why did you come down why here? You come, you should have okay. just stayed there. His Vulcan yeah, speed. So that's, yes, I, <laughs> of course. His Vulcan speed. Well, <laughs> mine is uh maybe like a bigger thing and we have not talked about this subplot at all and I think that kind of speaks to why it's my Darnage Jim moment or series of moments. During this whole time there's a Klingon ship that's that's like stalking them because oh, yeah. like there's a young buck <laughs> captain who randomly has a vendetta against Kirk and it really like they come in handy at the very end, you know, ultimately they're the ones who beam Kirk up off the planet, but like I think you could have excised that whole. There's a cling. There's another Klingon ship, and been fine. I don't think you need that at all. No way. To, I, that's what? One of my, really? That's one of my favorite aspects oh, of this movie okay. that there is something going on this entire time, and it's almost like what it's like with those movies where like somebody's trying to get at somebody, and then they like they jump at them, but that's the moment they like turn to walk away, and then they like fall flat every time. Kind of what it feels like. <laughs> but I thought they. I almost thought they didn't do enough of the well, Klingon you, to help set that. up to help set up Star Trek Six, right? It's almost like you know we know why Kirk hates the Klingons, but he just kind of accepts them being a character in this movie. And all of a sudden, Star Trek Six, it's like, well, I hate their freaking guts, and you're like, oof, you know, like they should have done a little bit more, like yeah. maybe damage the ship a little bit more. So he's like, it yeah. just all starts to bottle up mm. or. Or they have more uh -huh. interactions with them that cause them all to just be like, this is Klingons are so annoying. You know, I can, I I can co-sign that. I could co-sign that. I, I guess I would be in favor of not doing it at all or doing it harder. Yeah. So I think what that's, about this? Tell I, me. I thought of this too. Is <laughs> okay. The planet has Terran, Klingon, and Romulan. Why mm -hmm. didn't they make them Romulans? They're so afraid of the Romulans because that's, in Star Trek Three, do they just not do they not track? Is that like doesn't pull good? I don't know. Star Trek fans or something? Originally in Star Trek Three, the Klingons were supposed to be Romulans, and they were like, ah, Romulans. People don't remember Romulans, so just make them Klingons again. <laughs> and in this, yeah, I thought the same thing. It's like we see the other two, but like poor Caitlin Dar is just like, I guess the Romulans are coming. Maybe I, I don't know. Right, right. <laughs> we don't really get anything there. So yes, I, I thought that was a mistake. Also a good point. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, let's let's look at some good then, everybody. What, uh, Amanda? What is your fascinating moment? So I think more of my favorite moments are just the heckling bits between Bach and McCoy, yeah. and yep. so That's like one. one in particular is when I think they're in the shuttle and they're going to the uh, another shuttle moment, Steve, and <laughs> they're going to the Enterprise. And Spock, uh, no, Kirk makes some some like classic quote, and Bones tries to name it off and gets it wrong. And oh, Spock yeah, names he it. says it's Melville, but it's not a Melville quote. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And Spock corrects correct him, him, and he's like, um, Bones is like, "Are you sure about that?" Spock's like, "Well, I'm well versed in the classics, Doctor." And then Bones shoots back with, "Then how come you don't know row, row, row your boat?" Yeah. <laughs> so, like, just things like that, yeah. or when when Kirk is threatening to like deck Spock, and Bones is like, "Oh, I'll hold it for you." Yeah. So I think yeah. so funny. <laughs> I think just That's the so dynamic good. of their yeah. relationship is yes. really one of my that, favorite elements. 
Leading to the jailbreak with Scotty is so funny. When when Spock says that, uh, you know, he well, he's my brother, and Kirk is like, "You made that up." <laughs> it's just like yeah, it's does. a funny, like <laughs> petulant response. Amanda, we're we're right on the same page here because that the the little triad is mine. Like yeah. I said it earlier, this is the best representation of Kirk, Spock, and McCoy in in the movies, and I think you get it all. I mean, you get you get the the brotherly bond that they all have. You get. The, the true bond. I mean, like at the end, Kirk is kind of saying like, we are family. You know, he's mm. like, I lost a brother once, uh, but I, I got him back. Like talking about Spock, right. just sort of acknowledging that like, they are more to each other than just coworkers or and even more than just friends. Like they have reached this point where they are each other's family. And I mm. think that's just really nice to see. I do think it's funny that Kirk says, I lost a brother, but luckily I got him back, when in fact, Kirk did have a brother who died in the original series, oh. but it's, <laughs> yeah. I wasn't even going to mention it. It's fine. Uh, so, it wasn't really no, a brother. Back. Yeah, just the whole, uh, yeah. <laughs> I had a real brother who died, didn't get him back, but you, my friend, uh, I did I did get you back. Oh, so. gosh. Steve, <laughs> what about you, buddy? What, what's yours? It was so hard to nail down for me. I think I think the the thing that I did enjoy the most and was surprised about rewatching it uh, uh, was the soundtrack that just for me yeah. that mm-hmm. nailed it out of the park. I was like, Holy crap. This is so good. And it's, and it's probably besides star Trek three, the one that I've seen the least. Okay. Um, and so, you know, coming back and just being like, wow, like I've deprived myself of watching this with the soundtrack all these times. I also think that, uh, luck and bill nails it. Mm, yes you yep. know for me like I, I think he does the the uh, he does a great passionate vulcan right mm-hmm. because we've never i mean in the entire star trek have we seen a vulcan that has succumbed to its more passionate state of yeah, mind so I mean, not, later. not not in like a happy way i don't think so not in like a happy way no. yeah right. where he's like he is embracing all of his emotions yeah it, it, but but yeah that like we just think it's violent emotions and it's like well because they do kind of allude to that yeah in the in the original series that it's like they are trying to suppress the carnal not carnal that's the wrong word. primal <laughs> primal yeah, the yeah. primal primal thank well, you yeah in, primal. In, in some of the early reviews cybok was one of the things that was pretty consistently praised like uh, yeah. Let's see. In USA Today, they said he has the voice and stature of the golden screen's most scintillating intellectual villains. Uh, wow. And then, uh, let's see, the the uh, advertiser, they say, uh, Cybuck was considered to be the most distinctive, compelling villain of the series since Khan, which I think is definitely true. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. you know, it, it, I think it, people generally liked Cybok, not Gene Roddenberry, but other people. I, I, think, I think that is one thing that like I mean, Amanda kind of alluded to it too. That like you you want to listen to what he has to say, yeah. and you are interested in his character. And so you know, kind of going back to that whole like we didn't even need to reveal because you're sitting there kind of listening to every word he has to say. He doesn't need to tell you everything. You're sitting there listening, and you're like, oh man, I'm brainwashed too. But like, I, I just thought his character. I thought he nailed it out of park. I, I, you know, and I just laughed when I read that Sean Connery was was there for the <laughs> role. And it's just like, there's no way Sean Connery could have been this dynamic. And, and I love Cybok's role from the very beginning, where he's convinced that he's right, and then they're on the journey, and in the very end, him realizing what he did was wrong and redeeming himself. He's the only character in this movie that has a story arc to it mm. where the triad is really a reinforcement of those characters i, I agree true. with you that that's great where yeah. they're basically all of the all of the funny little things that they say that when i was young i didn't get now i get now because i've seen every frame of star trek that they're reinforcing the three of them yeah, and and I, I I think you made the great point of this is the this is the movie where they're all the whole movie they're all together. Yeah, it's very significant in Star Trek, but like, but Cybok has a character has a full arc, a character development, leading up to him sacrificing himself and, and ultimately exploding via torpedo. But like, yeah. I just thought that that was really cool how he's introduced. We're just supposed to, you're just forced to be like, all right, well, I guess he's kind of canon 
now. And by the end of the movie, you're like, oh, man, like, no way. Like, oh, he dies. And it's just like, well, that sucks because he kind of redeemed himself. And he he was almost apologetic for it. Like, oh, my goodness, I am so sorry. Like, this is not what I had intended. This is not what I thought. I've been fooled. And it's just like. And then he dies, and right. he's like, and Dang, instead of I trying to like... save himself, he he sacrifices save... himself. Yeah, quite, yeah, quite a quite a yeah, nod it's... to his character. It's kind of a power move when he goes in and like fights the god entity. Yeah, and he's like, face. tell me about also, your pain. Also, Luck and Bill's acting as the villain when he's when he's the god entity takes on the form of Cybok, and so he's saying those lines about like watching them suffer and everything. He really nails that too. He, he really changes. nails the. Mm-hmm. He does. Totally changes. Fully changes. Fully changes. Yeah. yeah. At the Lucille Ball Desi Arnaz Museum in Jamestown, New York, nearby where we're recording, uh, in one of the rooms, there is a big, it's like Lucy's car, and it says, donated by Lawrence Luckenbill, because, you know, that was his mother in law. And uh, I just laugh every time I see that, because I'm like, this is Cybok's car that I'm looking <laughs> at right here. <laughs> oh, man. Funny. All right, so um, I feel like it's kind of hard to rate, but but uh, warp factor what out of five? What do you think? Hmm. I Man. I think at this point, as an adult, I can probably label it as a three, but it's oh okay, it's a, it's a kind of a was... question mark in some ways. Yeah, three. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right. Maybe like a high two, maybe at a, a low three. I was okay. going to say a 3.5. Okay. okay. I think I think five years ago, I v- would have rated it much lower. I probably would have rated it a two. Mm. But going back and really seeing how it kind of fits in the Star Trek saga, I have to give it a little bit more props. I really mm. do. Yeah. You know, it's 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 funny. It's This is what, Kirk's second directing? He did like an episode of Tech War, and then he's doing a major motion picture oh, wow. that has thirty years of IP behind it. Like, yeah. that's pretty staggering to think of that he managed to pull this off, and it not being a complete nightmare. And so, yeah, and I think a lot of the problems too were outside of his control. It's mm-hmm. like you know there were strikes True. happening, and like the, the the funding falling through, and like a lot yeah. of things that we're really outside of Shatner's control and I feel like he still puts together a good movie. That's now, fair. I recognize that I can no longer be objective because <laughs> I rated fine. this on Letterboxd after I watched it and I gave it the full five stars because even though it has its dumb moments like Cybok throwing Kirk around and him just floating through the air and like <laughs> little things like that, I just spend the whole time just watching it and loving it like i just i'm not like oh while you're watching oh it's this sure. part oh i hate this part no i don't feel that way at all i'm mm-hmm. just like yeah keep it coming i love it so i'm i'm going to give i'm going to give it the 5 nice but yeah i like i said i mean i can't really be objective anymore cuz i i just love it and oh, five. i just I just enjoy all of them. So I wouldn't give Star Trek the motion picture a five because that is a tough sit. It has good yeah. moments, but oh my gosh, 90 <laughs> minutes of just looking at exterior shots of the ship. It's like, fellas, can we, can we move it along? That, that would, but, yeah. No, I love it. But I will say I'm glad that this is not how we went out. I, I think probably with a title like The Final Frontier, there was probably some thoughts with Next Gen starting that this really yeah. would be oh, the end of fair. it. I'm, I'm glad that they kind of were like, well... Well, let's do one more. One more. Because I think yeah. the, the undiscovered country really does feel like a more proper end and it feels like more classic totally. Star Trek. So, you know, I am glad for that, but I do love this movie and I will defend it. Yeah. No, it's a good watch <laughs> and I do especially enjoy it for the nostalgia factor. This was Steve's pick. You were you were like, We gotta do Star Trek five. Yeah, we gotta. So yeah. I'm I'm glad I'm glad we were able to do it mm-hmm. because uh, yeah. Always good to revisit. And it's been a while. It really has been a while since I... I saw Wrath of Khan in theaters when they did the 40th anniversary. Um, but I haven't seen this movie in a long time. So I'm glad to have... And this is the first time I watched it on Blu-ray. And it was a really good uh, like transfer. You know, it looked really good in Blu-ray. Oh, nice. I think it kind of still... Yeah. I watched it from Paramount oh. Plus. Oh, okay. But you have a Blu-ray. I've seen it. <laughs> I know. I literally... I know. I, I also have the disc right here. Yeah. but crazy i just and i regretted i regretted doing that after i was just like after i read about like the rock creatures and i was like oh dang there's all those like 
deleted scenes that I'm sure yeah. are on the oh, disc yeah. that there I are just some, completely deprived are, myself of because I watched the Paramount Plus version. Yeah. I still have my DVD box set and I have that old VHS box set and I have uh, I got the Blu-ray set a few yeah. years back. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I do. Looks good. It looks good. Okay. Well, Amanda, thanks for uh, you know coming out of retirement here to talk with us about <laughs> Star Trek. Uh, it was nice to talk about something that we enjoyed rather than the, the series yeah. of books we've oh, been gosh, on. Oh gosh, yes. Maybe well, so. maybe next time we'll we'll find a Star Wars one that we like, and we'll we say that every year we don't I, do that's it. So true. So. That's so true. Well, well, hopefully so. with the Star Trek one, we can at least continue forward with good choices and all really come away yes. feeling like yes. yes this was nice we're tuning yeah. up, turning a new leaf with a yes new yeah yes here. yeah this this set us on the right course well you can hear all the back episodes of all of the library podcasts at soundcloud.com slash all the books where amanda pops up in quite a few of those episodes and over on the library's regular show but have you tried this time i had to show Allie something new and so i made her watch star trek the cage the original star trek pilot she'd never seen it before never heard of it before so you can listen over there and see what she thinks about it i love the cage so it was a, that's a good conversation so Tune in. Steve and I will be right here next week where we shuttle back to Endor for Ewoks number 12. Beware the thorn monster. (laughs) All right. So you can read along with us and then we'll be back in two weeks to talk about the thorn monster. So Amanda, thanks again. Yes. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, Live long and prosper. So long, everybody. Woohoo! This Endorian Life was brought to you by the Radio Me and Network. Other shows on the network include 9021 Here We Go, 90s Music Got Me Like, and Previously on X-Men. Share your thoughts on this and upcoming episodes by following us on Facebook or X at Endorian Life. And please rate, subscribe, and share the show wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs>